everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Zara Alani. It is my pleasure to host this episode of the Future of Food 2.0, Building Agritech Clusters. Today's event is sponsored by Abbotsford Tech District, Emily Bio Enterprise, Farm Credit Canada, and the University of the Fraser Valley. We thank them all for their support. Now, I am a seasoned broadcaster and trained meteorologist coming to you live today from Vancouver, British Columbia. Yes, it is a beautiful day here today, but a change is moving in. Have to talk about that as I have meteorology in my background, but also be, with meteorology and being in British Columbia, we have these fascinating microclimates and an agriculture scene. So that is really relevant to our food discussion today. And I am pleased to be here with you as we discuss how to build the future of food a subject of great importance to everyone on this planet. So for nearly a year now, City H has been working with our partners to bring together leaders using data and technology to build our food system for a more sustainable future. That work has resulted in the Future Food Series and today's latest installment, episode three. We're thrilled to be with you again for a focused look at how leading regions are driving strategies to foster and attract talent and build amazing companies. This is what we call agritech clusters, and they are vitally important to Canada, which is one of the world's true food superpowers, but Canada has yet to reach its full potential. So before we get right into this uh, discussion today, I've got a few quick reminders. We would love for you to jump into the chat section below. So when you comment, just make sure to direct your comments to all panelists and attendees so that we can all read your comments and insights. Um, and we do this because it automatically sets to panelists only. So if we can all jump right down to the chat section, let it pop up and choose all panelists and attendees. Um, and now for your specific questions, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Those will go straight to our speakers and panelists so that they can answer them and it's not lost in the chat. So feel free to jump into the chat section right now and tell us your name and where you're Zooming from. Uh, let's also get interactive right off the bat with a poll question. It'll pop up on your screen and you'll have four choices for this very first poll question. And then throughout the session, we will reveal the results as we go through. And there's gonna be more poll questions. So please do re be ready to do that. I'm just gonna close mine right now. And then we are gonna start with Hannah Tucker today, our first speaker. She, is, uh, she does independent research into the disruptive developments reshaping the economy with a focus on food systems. She presents this content to various audiences while working with clients on strategy and communications through her advisory business, Balance Point Ventures. Hannah is also the founder of Disruption Dinner, an ex experiential events business providing culinary adventures in our changing food system. Previously, Hannah worked in sustainable investing, mostly notably alongside Al Gore at Generation Investment Management. So Hannah Tucker, welcome. The Director of Balance Point Ventures, please take over. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to share with you my perspectives today in food systems disruption. So let me share my screen here so we can get going. Now I'm going to be talking today about our food system and how it's being disrupted, but I first want to talk about ants and their food system. Now the ant trail is a familiar sight to many of us. Ants follow the pheromone trail from their home base to an established food source. And while the majority of ants never leave this trail. There's also another type of ant, and it's this ant right here, the forager ant, whose role it is to constantly scout out new food sources and be ready to lead the colony on a new path forward as the established food source runs out. So we'll come back to these ants at the end, but a question for you right at the beginning as we go through the presentation is, in a time of food systems disruption, what type of ant are you? Are you a follower or are you a forager? Today, I'd like to take you on a three-part journey. Part one, I'll answer the question of why now? Why is food systems disruption happening now? And I'll argue that it forms part of a much greater wave of economic transformation. Second question, where are we headed? Here we'll explore the modern food system, a system that's aligned with the conditions and capabilities of the 2020s. And then lastly, we'll take a look at who's leading the way and what it takes to be a modern food innovator. So let's get going. 
food systems disruption forms part of a much greater wave of economic transformation underway, one that is pulling us away from the industrial economic system that we've known over the past 150 years towards a modern economy, one that is forming all around us today. The driver behind this wave of transformation are disruptive changes in the social and environmental conditions surrounding the economy and in the informational and technological capabilities underpinning the economy. Disruptive changes in both areas are accumulating and converging, acting to destabilize the industrial economic system. Let's take a closer look at changes in conditions. Now, when the industrial economy first began in the 1870s, then there were a billion people living with relatively low levels of development, but nevertheless, access to abundant stores of natural resources amidst a stable climate. Today, however, we're 8 billion people with high, albeit unequal levels of development. And we're contending with degraded resources in a context of climate volatility. Turning to informational and technological capabilities, in the 1870s, the combustion engine marked the forefront of progress, and it enabled us to work with energy, matter, and information in superior ways. Today, however, we've moved on with computing and electronics, again, enabling us to work in very different ways with energy, matter, and information. What this means in practice is that we're no longer limited to the level of our natural senses, what we can physically control, whether that's digging for coal, corralling animals, or writing letters. Instead, with computing and electronics, we're able to go well beyond our natural senses into artificial realms. And that's enabling us to operate at the level of electrons and photons, cells and molecules, bytes, bits, and qubits. Now, these capabilities aren't new, but what is new is just how competitive they're becoming. Let's take a snapshot over the last 20 years of cost. Cost of computing performance, data storage, solar PV batteries, LED, genomics, all have come down over 100 times, and this trend continues going forward. Now, all of these changes coming together, as we saw, are acting to destabilize the industrial economy. They are headwinds to continued progress. But what we often don't see is that the very same forces are also acting as enablers for a new modern economic system. And this modern economic system is what is enabling as well new ways of supplying food to meet the demand. So that's what we're going to look at next, where we're headed. And the answer is that we're headed away from the industrial food system we've known all of our lives towards a modern food system. So starting with the industrial. This, again, is a system that we developed in the 1870s in response to the conditions and capabilities of that time. The resulting centralized value chain is resource heavy. It starts with a plan to maximize profitability. From there, it focuses on sourcing raw ingredients from a select number of domesticated organisms raised in monocultured fields and facilities, then goes on to be produced into final plastic package, commoditized ingredients in centralized manned factories. From there, we distribute these ingredients long distances through industrial transport and communication networks to finally be bought in physical locations based on cultural associations or brands to be eaten at home on the go or in restaurants. This is what we're moving away from. What we're moving towards is a modern food system aligned for the conditions and capabilities of today. So unlike the industrial, it's a decentralized model and it's resource light. It also starts with a plan, but one that's enhanced with software, enabling us to optimize across multiple metrics. We're sourcing a raw ingredients from an array of organisms and cells this time, ones that we're cultivating with precision resource use. We're then able to produce these ingredients into final bio-packaged customized ingredients in local autonomous solar and wind powered facilities, which are then distributed locally through decentralized network service with smartphones, autonomous electric vehicles, 3D printers, et cetera, 
all to be experienced in conjunction with our digital devices, which enable on-demand delivery, personalization, interactivity, transparency, social media engagement. Now, I know this sounds futuristic and is theoretical, so I'd like to bring it to life for you with an example, more specifically, the tale of three cheeseburgers. So we're gonna look at a cheeseburger three ways, industrial, modern indoor, and modern outdoor. So starting with the industrial, it's no surprise that the industrial cheeseburger is no longer sustainable and it's no longer competitive for the same reasons that the industrial economy as a whole is challenged. Let's take a look, for example, at how the industrial cheeseburger fares under a climate change scenario. Today, it has become the villain of the climate crisis, being held responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, destroying carbon sinks, depleting freshwater. And these are all liabilities for the companies making industrial cheeseburgers. On the other hand, though, it's also a victim of the climate crisis. It's subject to this volatility in outdoor industrial environments. And this has a negative impact. Profitability increases risk. Now, we've known this for a long time, and we've tried to source alternatives for beef and dairy. We looked within the animal kingdom for alternatives, and we looked within neighboring plant, fungus, and algae kingdoms. But none of these strategies worked. They either ran into the same scaling issues, or they were simply inferior in their sensory experience. Take, for example, chickens. We now have 24 billion of them on the planet, outnumbering us three to one. That is, however, Intel now. I'm gonna tell you about why the modern indoor cheeseburger is different. We saw before how modern capabilities are enabling us to tap into this precision level of cells and molecules. And while we often think of that in relation to advances in healthcare, it's also where the action today is happening in food. So let's go back to the biosphere. Now we're no longer limited to that macroscopic layer, but we can delve into the previously imperceptible microscopic realm to source the molecules we desire directly from the cells of multicelled organisms or from single-celled microorganisms. Now let's see how companies are harnessing this approach, starting with plants and the example of Beyond Meat. So Beyond Meat set out in 2009 with a mission to replicate the molecular properties of beef, but with plants. And it does this with big data analytics. Step one was to determine all of the molecular components of beef that makes beef beef. Discovered the importance, for example, of heme protein for umami taste and red color. Then what it did next was scour the plant kingdom to find comparable molecules it could use to replicate this. It sourced them from all of these different types of plants shown here, then worked with different suppliers to isolate the exact molecules desired and now runs this molecular mixture through precision extruders to replicate the texture desired. Beyond Burger is growing all around the world, it's now a six billion market cap company. The story doesn't start there, it's in fact just beginning. Let's take a look at what one company is doing with yeast cells. Now yeast has long been used as an enhancer to our foods. For example, it's responsible for the alcohol in beer. But what's different is that in the 1980s, we discovered we could genetically modify yeast to produce just about any molecule we desired. So first did this for insulin protein, and figured out it was applicable to food too. We started making rennet for cheese, but now today it's cost competitive with bulk animal proteins. So Impossible uses it to make the heme molecule we saw earlier mixed with plant ingredients. You get your Impossible Burger. Perfect Day uses it to make casein and whey found in dairy. Again, mixed with plant molecules, you get Perfect Day Dairy. Both companies also growing strongly. Possible's in, um, expecting a 10 billion IPO and Perfect Day has 360 million in private funding. Now let's look at another development in animal cells as our story does not stop with yeast. We're now able to grow meat directly from animal cells. So what was holding this back before was the cost of the growth culture. This was very expensive, particularly at the scale demanded. But now with precision fermentation, which we just saw, we can make the proteins and other molecules needed for growth cultures cheaply, but not compromising on the quality. 
This is converging with other developments like 3D printing to enable commercially competitive stem cell meat. This year, Upside, it used to be called Memphis Meat, is launching chicken. And KFC is trialing this in its Moscow restaurant of the future. What would a cheeseburger be, however, without the lettuce, pickle, and tomato? We also have an indoor solution here that is resulting from the convergence of big data analytics, solar and storage, LED, robotics, et cetera. Now, as all of the costs of these technologies come down and their performance increases, this is making vertical farming increasingly competitive. So one example is 80 acre farms and 80 acre has pioneered an approach it calls plantopia, perfecting conditions with computer software for individual plant species. And its approach so far compared to the industrial model yields 300 times, uses 90% less land, 97% less water, 100% renewable, gets to market in one, not 14 days and cuts out food miles. 80 Acre Farms recently partnered with Ocado online grocery distributor, you might know them through Sobeys in Canada, to integrate vertical farming directly into online grocery distribution centers. Okay, so that in short is the modern indoor way with a cheeseburger, has pros and cons, however. Environmentally, yes, this is key for food security. It also frees up areas previously used for industrial ag, but it's overall depleted. So it's still got a small negative impact. Health, yes, we're getting fresher ingredients, often free of chemicals, but they also can be nutrient poor and tend to be for ultra processed foods that are more inflammatory and contain novel ingredients. And then jobs, automation is rolling into the food system and this results in job reduction, but we also have the opportunity to create new modern jobs in food. Indoor is not the only path. So let's look at modern outdoor to learn about this system. Returning to the biosphere, here the approach is about harnessing the previously imperceptible interconnectivity of the biosphere. Commonly referred to as regenerative agriculture, in this model, each organism generates multiple sources of value, not just food. So take the cow, not only is this a source of nutrient rich, beef and dairy, but the cow also stomps carbon back into the soil. It provides fertilizer. It helps keep up the soil microbiome and it's the gardener, the plant maintenance. Peas like those that go into beyond meat also have multiple sources of value, not just food, but as cover crops, fertilizer as well, even as bee food. So these are ancient techniques I'm talking about here, but what's different today is we can now measure the multiple streams of value with precision. Again, with big data analytics, sensors, drones, satellites, blockchain, robotics, genomics, all converging into one. And what we can measure, we can manage and we can monetize. I'm not just talking about selling food on digital platforms direct to consumer or ecosystem or ecotourism. Those are important sources of value. I'm also talking though about governments changing their entire agricultural subsidy scheme over to ecosystem services away from food commodities. That's what's happening here in the UK post-Brexit. And also companies clamoring to buy carbon offsets and increasingly trade them on digital platforms. This isn't a fantasy. In fact, many of the big food companies are getting behind it, such as those shown here. While they're starting with the basic steps like General Mills and its six principles here, they're working towards capturing the full spectrum of value we just discussed. Okay, so that's the modern outdoor burger, again, with pros and cons. Environmental impact, this time it's regenerative, so it's a positive impact and it's acting to stabilize the climate, but it's still volatile. It's a climate volatility, even if it's more resilient. Sorry, it's still vulnerable. Health impact, more nutrient dense, fresh chemical whole foods on one hand, also cleaner air, water, and the ability to reconnect with nature. But just to note that if those foods end up in ultra processed and food products, we lose some of the benefits. And then same on job impact, automation is here, but we also have the potential to create new jobs such as those in ecosystem services. 
Okay, so that was a taste of where we're headed. Lastly, who is leading the way? When it comes to modern indoor innovators, they tend to cluster in areas experiencing both social and environmental extremes. So large populations in urban areas, the worst effects of the climate crisis, and also areas where there's an edge in informational and technological capabilities. So Singapore is one, Nanjing is another, Dubai, Tel Aviv, San Francisco, the line which is being built in Saudi Arabia, and even the futuristic Mars city underway. This is in contrast to clusters of modern outdoor innovators that tend instead to be in places rich in biological capital where there's public support for environmental services. So I mentioned the UK, proving Amazon is another one, South Africa, the US, Canada, depths of the ocean, New Zealand are all taking part in regenerative agriculture. In terms of what path is right for what region, this really depends on how the disruptive changes are playing out because although we're all subject to them, there's great variability around the world. It's also worth noting that they're not mutually exclusive paths. Indeed, we can follow, follow strategies combining all of them as they're quite complementary. Regardless of the path on business model, it's important to keep in mind that what got us here won't get us there. So the industrial model, as we saw briefly before, is one in which the competitive advantage depended on being centralized, vertically integrated, using mass stores of resources, and producing commoditized and concentrated product offerings. Whereas today, the modern business model we're seeing emerging is about decentralization, so digital platforms enabling a distributed model, precision renewable resource use, and also offering customized and diversified products that we're able to do now thanks to softwares enabling us to design foods and manage multiple value streams. So I'll just end with a question we started on now. In a time of food systems disruption, what role do you aspire to play? Are you a follower ant or are you a forager ant? Many thanks for your time and I look forward to your questions. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Hannah. I love learning about growth cultures as I didn't know that much about it. And it's wonderful to see the positive potential environmental impacts it has. And I've also noticed a lot of our viewers from home do have questions for Hannah. So just a reminder at the bottom of your screen for direct questions to the panelists, put them in the Q&A section so they're not lost within the comments. And then hopefully Hannah will have some time to uh, get back into them. So it looks like we are gonna reveal the poll results right now. It'll pop up on your screen. Our question was, how would you describe Canada's investment in food, tech, or agri-tech? And it looks like most of you, rather nearly half of you, have chosen we don't invest enough. So it looks like there's room for growth still for Canada in that area. Now we're moving on to our next speaker, Gavin Dew. Actually, before we do that, my apologies, there was a poll question that popped up on your screen. So we're gonna go for that right now. You do have four options yet once again, the question being what should be our number one primary focus in agri-tech investment? So please take your time, put in your answer and we will reveal the poll answer as we go throughout the episode. Now to our next speaker, it is Gavin Dew. Gavin aims to build an agri-tech cluster in British Columbia's Fraser Valley. It's already one of the continent's most productive spots when it comes to agriculture, but can it be equivalent to Silicon Valley for agriculture? Well, Gavin thinks it can be. And as the chief strategic advisor to Abbotsford Tech District, he is well-versed in the subject. He has also proposed an innovation district on Sumas Mountain designed to help secure Abbotsford's place as the agricultural technology and food security hub of BC. Now, this would be incredible growth right here at home. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Gavin, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, those of you who are eagle-eyed may have noticed that uh, the schedule changed abruptly, and that's because technology is fallible in all areas, and my computer system managed to crash just as I was logging on, only to be immediately followed by my neighbor starting to mow their lawn loudly. So we're going to push right through here, and we're going to recognize that with all technology comes risk. Let's make it a metaphor. So uh, I'm here today to talk about Abbotsford Tech District. And what I'll do is provide a little bit of context around where we are in British Columbia and what we're trying to achieve. 
I was so impressed by what Hannah had to say. And really what we're trying to do is enable more of what Hannah is talking about uh, in terms of both applied research and innovation uh, and also uh, study on, on food security and the implications of the changing nature of ag uh, and food. Uh, I would also add, I was uh, intrigued to see the poll result and the reference to, to uh, you know, inadequate investment. And I think certainly that's something that we can help to, to unlock. So um, what is Abbotsford De Tech District? Why is Abbotsford Tech Dist District? Um, we often, uh, you know, have, have been talking about agriculture for a long time. We have a huge agricultural sector, obviously in British Columbia, uh, but we have done uh, not as much as we could have over the past years to really get uh, more innovative and to enable agricultural technology to flourish in a structured way. So we have a tremendous base in British Columbia in terms of very successful companies and organizations that are uh, thriving here. Uh, and uh, we have a huge number uh, of, of obviously people working in the sector, uh, people uh, 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 going through agricultural uh, education, but we really don't have enough that brings things together. Gavin, I just wanna jump in. Um fascinating and being somebody from British Columbia I am so into what you're saying and I was going to say you may want to not share your screen and so that we can see you in full presentation mode okay and I'm trying like to, to share, share my, my slide deck here is that working uh I'm sorry I'm not sure why that's not uh that's not working properly to be perfectly honest I'm going to I do see it but I think it's not large enough we could try it again just one moment here. And, and I this is Zoom to... life, everybody. This is what happens. Here we go. This is probably what we were trying to achieve, isn't it? There you go. What do you know? I thought you weren't seeing my notes. Now you were. We're having fun today, guys. Uh, oh, everything's in the trial we experimentation. See... Yes, we can so see your absolutely. notes and we can see your face. Uh, great. Fantastic. Okay. So um, again, really strong base in British Columbia. Huge opportunity. Let's dig right into what we're trying to uh, to achieve uh, in terms of, of the sector. So we're building on a base, uh, which is uh, called the Premier's Food Security Task Force. That really has informed a huge amount of our thinking in terms of the way that British Columbia is evolving as a sector. Uh, this group was brought together, and you'll hear from one of the members uh, in a few minutes, Lenore Newman, as part of a panel. Uh, and there was some excellent work done around what do we need to do in British Columbia to enable innovation, to enable acceleration, uh, to enable more research commercialization and build a stronger sector. So we've built on that. And what we're trying to do is achieve two of the key goals of that uh, task force of recommendations, uh, which includes establishing uh, an incubation and acceleration strategy for our sector, as well as bringing together multiple post-secondary institutions uh, in that regard. So, you know, this is just a bit of a carpet of logos, which I always use to try to tell the story of our sector in British Columbia and of what we're trying to do, which is to bring those pieces together and to be, uh, you know, a connector, a broker, a one window in terms of all manner of different uh, ag interests, academic, commercial and community uh, coming together uh, in order to, to innovate. Why are we trying to do this uh, in Abbotsford? For those of you who are from British Columbia or know about British Columbia, this may be obvious, but for those of you who are not, uh, Abbotsford obviously uh, is uh, a tremendously, tremendously productive agricultural jurisdiction in Canada. We see huge potential for it to become the most innovative. So there's a huge amount of uh, access to large scale farming. There's obviously uh, incredibly uh, good connectivity to uh, the US market as it relates to the Cascadia corridor and uh, technology uh, that has become a huge sort of West Coast component, uh, the direct access to an airport located in Abbotsford is huge for us. And we see a tremendous amount of great work happening academically and commercially in the area. So that's the context within which we're doing what we're trying to do. Uh, who the heck are we and what are we actually trying to do? Really, at the end of the day, we're in the space business. We are, uh, you know, we're we're a land developer. Uh, we uh, uh, go back about 25 years as an organization, own a significant portion of land, and what we're trying to do is really catalyze the development of a high tech hub on what's called uh, Sumas Mountain, which is uh, um, just outside of 
uh, Abbotsford City Center. So the basic premise uh, is to build out a space that includes uh, post-secondary teaching and learning, research commercialization, brings together a complete community with residential, with office, with commercial, and really creates a place where people can connect and collide. Uh, what I always mention to people is that nobody goes somewhere for one job in tech, they go somewhere for three or five jobs in tech because the average person now stays in a job for 18 months. So we're really trying to create a place where that can happen with direct adjacency and connectivity to the most productive agricultural jurisdiction uh, in, in Canada. And specifically the way we're trying to catalyze that uh, is through the creation of a, a cornerstone facility that uh, we are calling the BLO Center for Innovation and Food Security at this time. And that's named after the, the, uh, the founder of the company, Augustin, that I'm working with uh, to, uh, to do that. And the intention is really, we want to endow a substantial facility that plays host to post-secondary commercialization, uh, to, uh, to a university industry liaison office that allows industry to connect with a variety of different post-secondary partners and programs, and really importantly, that creates a place where the next generation of people working in ag and innovating in ag are able to come together, meet, connect, collide, work together, and innovate. So we see that as really the cornerstone of our entire development, where for our purposes, it's a community benefit that we're providing to the city and to the region with a significant economic development impact, but it's also really the cornerstone of what we're trying to do. We're trying to energize the area, and frankly, by having students coming through, innovation coming through, ideas coming through, that creates a place where agricultural technology companies, whether they're a one-person startup or a 500 person office can logically be located uh, very, very close to actual farming. So again, we see that as about a $50 million endowment that we're going to bring to bear. That is an investment on our part to create the cornerstone for what we're doing. And I think as we expand over the course of this event today, we'll likely talk about what funding looks like, what investment looks like, how do we unlock value that allows us to do more around ag and ag innovation. And we're really excited about the approach that we're taking, which we think is quite innovative uh, in that it requires uh, you know, not much in the way of, of, of government investment to unlock significant resources, especially in the post-secondary context, where uh, I should mention that the University of the Fraser Valley are a key, key uh, academic partner uh, to us in that regard. So obviously, as it relates to the overall region, we see this as a huge economic development uh, play for the area where we, over the course of decades, would be investing several billion dollars in building out this space. We would be really having a significant impact in terms of uh, great jobs, opportunities around innovation, opportunities for young people, and an opportunity to capture ideas and innovation and bring them to bear. I always sort of tell the story of a bit of a life cycle, uh, which, uh, which I think really illustrates what we are trying to achieve. And I've got, uh, I'm always tempted to call the little girl Abby, because that's my daughter's name, and we're in Abbotsford. But, uh, you know, we like to talk about this sort of avatar as a person and the experience we're trying to create for them. Really, it's about that young person, let's call her Anna, who was born and raised uh, in an agricultural family. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, but she's interested in ag. And what we're seeing is a lot of young people getting excited about food. When you look at opinion research, you look at data, you look at markets, you're seeing people very interested in where food comes from, the ethics around food, the sustainability of food. Hannah touched on some really, really uh, key components there. So that individual is getting excited about food. We want people to be able to go get exposed to innovation that is happening around food and food security. And we're very focused on making sure that's part of what we do is creating exciting places where young people can get inspired to study agriculture, agricultural innovation and related fields and get inspired to go off and do post-secondary that relates to that and become the farmers of the future. Uh, so, you know, we envision that after being inspired, you've got the opportunity for young Anna to go off and take part in one of a number of different academic programs. We're not trying to replace universities. 
we would be partnering with a number of post-secondary institutions and bringing together the range of different fantastic teaching and learning and research programs that exist in British Columbia. Uh, the premise that we're exploring is the idea of a capstone program that would bring people together from multiple institutions who've got you know, their three years of experience, whether it's in mechatronics or agriculture or commerce, and bring them together in groups who are then going to work together, innovate together, and do a variety of different activities that give them hands-on exposure to industry. So that could be working as consulting teams with existing agricultural businesses and working to help them identify efficiencies or opportunities for innovation. It could be working with startup companies, any of those kinds of opportunities that basically provide value to industry, provide a track into jobs and provide an opportunity for folks to get some dirt on their boots. The goal then is to have an incubator accelerator where if Anna's got a fantastic idea, she's able to graduate into an incubator and take that idea, build it up with support, advice, mentorship, and wraparound services that allow that to be successful and ultimately to gain access uh, to capital, access to advice, uh, access uh, to markets, which would allow Anna's business to grow. We see that as being commercially beneficial for our purposes because that creates demand for the office space that we'd be building out. It creates a constant flow of smart, talented people to be hired by companies we hope to woo to be located here from around the region, around the country, and around the world. And we really see the opportunity to create a food, a feedback loop. I wanted to say a feedback loop uh, where folks like Anna are able to become that next generation of advisors, mentors, and investors who are really helping to bring up the next generation of agricultural uh, innovators, agricultural businesses, agricultural opportunity that, uh, that grows the local economy and obviously creates a greater degree of sustainability and food security. So that's what we're doing to try to, uh, to create a framework for the kinds of innovation that Hannah talked about. And I think I can leave it there and look forward to taking questions. Thank you so very much. Great, thank you so much, Gavin. I can already see that there's plenty of questions. And as we go throughout, everybody, just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A section. This way the panelists can see them and it's not lost in the chat section and they can, as Gavin, as Gavin said, he can hopefully get to that. So thank you so much, Gavin. That was absolutely fascinating. I see a lot more growth happening for the Fraser Valley with that. Um, let's go to our last poll question and see the results. It pops up on your screen. And the answer to what should be our number one primary focus in agritech investment, more than half of you chose the last choice, sustainable practices and crops. Great answers there. And thank you all for participating. We've got another poll question for you. It'll pop up on your screen. You've got five choices. Choose the one you want and we will reveal the results as we go throughout. Thank you for joining us today. Remember, I am your host for the day, Zara Alani. And we do want to hear your comments. So pop down to the chat section and choose panelists and attendees to send the comments to. And this way we can all participate. As for our next presenters, we are going to take a look at the world's agritech clusters and what we might learn from them. In our panel is Dr. Evan Fraser. He's director of the Arel Food Institute at the University of Guelph. He holds the Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security, is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and a professor of geography at the University of Guelph. Welcome, Dr. Fraser. And we also have Dr. Shock Wolfert, the Strategic Senior Scientist and Theme Ambassador for Digital Innovation in Agri-Food at Wageningen Economic Research, part of Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. His main research is the Internet of Things, Big Data and Digital Innovation Hubs. We also have with us Dr. Lenore Newman. She is a director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Food Security and Environment. She is an associate producer of the Department of Geography and the Environment at UFV and is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's New College. What an amazing panel. Thank you so much for being here and um, we're going to let you uh, take it away. 
So, well, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, what an extraordinary opportunity. I, I, I so enjoyed both Hannah and Gavin's remarks. Hannah, those are some of the most beautiful slides I've ever seen in a presentation. So, wow, I, I, I need to take some notes from, from your science communication skills. Hey, uh, Jacques and Lenore and I are excited to reflect on what it takes to make an ag tech innovation cluster or innovation zone. And uh, really, we're going to have a, a short conversation, the three of us, over the next uh, half hour or so, where we want to address three things. First of all, uh, we want to actually paint a picture for you, the audience, on what an ag technology cluster or hub or zone actually looks like. Uh, second, we're very keen to uh, describe how or reflect on how, based on our different perspectives, uh, uh, Lenore on the West Coast, myself based at the University of Guelph, Jacques based in the Netherlands, um, to reflect on how different clusters have been effective at bringing industrial players, policymakers, academics together in order to create that critical mass of innovation to allow a region, something like the region that uh, Gavin aspires to make or that, uh, that Hannah showed us a map of. Um, how do those happen in, in, in real terms? And then finally, our third part of our conversation will be really to try to distill lessons uh, that maybe other regions in Canada, such as uh, leaders like Gavin, might be able to distill or, or, or take from if they're trying to build a tech cluster of their own. So with that being said, let's, um, let's start with, with part one and, and what is these ag tech innovation zones like Hannah showed us on, on one of her gorgeous slides. And uh, for instance, the area around uh, Wagenheim where Jacques works in the Netherlands is known of as Food Valley and it's, it's characterized by world-class innovation in agriculture and food uh, and related technologies. Uh, maybe not modestly, I like to think that the University of Guelph where I work is home to a cluster of innovation in the broad area of agriculture. So I'd like to start with you, Jacques. Um, you know, and I draw from my own experience here. Uh, one of the key components that I think Guelph has is that it brings a research intensive university together with key government agencies. Um, and that sort of supports or creates a, a nucleus that supports spin-off companies and whatnot. But, you know, give us the sense from Food Valley in the Netherlands um, and paint us a picture. What, what does Food Valley look like? What kinds of infrastructure are needed uh, to support this sort of, this sort of innovation that we're, we're really talking about today? So over to you, Jacques. Okay, uh, thank you, Evan. <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, uh, we are talking about Food Valley. And if you would uh, visit us, it will be hard to uh, distinguish uh, or to see the valley, but it, it's there. If you would look at it from the, from the, from the sky, then there is really a valley uh, formed in the Ice Age, I, uh, I learned. Uh, but anyway, um, I think like Guelph, um, the, the, the Wageningen University and Research Organization is also here the, the nucleus of the, uh, of the Food Valley. Uh, and um, I think the organization of Wageningen University and Research is already unique uh, because I say Wageningen University and Wageningen Research, which are uh, basically two uh, different uh, legal entities. Uh, but they are under one umbrella. We have also one uh, big boss, uh, Louisa Fresco, you may know her, um, uh, but we are uh, working together. Um, uh, the university, of course, is focusing on education and, and more fundamental research. And then the Wageningen Research is a fusion, um, I think over maybe 30, 40 years already of uh, more applied uh, research uh, institutes. Uh, so we are um, yeah, serving the whole range of fundamental to uh, more applied research in a very continuum um, and, and in a continuous way. Um, so it's really the nucleus. But if you look at the different uh, scales, uh, so we have, of course, around Wageningen University Research, the, the, our campus, uh, which is actually, uh, is, is actually uh, quite new. When I was studying in, in Wageningen in the 90s, it was still scattered all over the, over the city. But luckily, we had also some 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 land around Wageningen, and we managed. Now, I think for ten or twenty years, it's 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 already there, the, a good campus, um, and we also managed managed to attract uh, a lot of um, yeah other companies and organizations around it, especially R and D departments of um, big food companies like Friesland Campina or Unilever, uh, especially their research and development uh, plans. Uh, but also big companies that have satellite offices, so, so just a few people uh, somewhere in an office at the at the campus, and then of course, uh, uh, like like other hubs uh, that were, were also presented today, uh, we have also a lot of startup and scale up companies uh, through accelerator uh, programs. 
Uh, so that's that's basically yeah what's happening there. And then you have uh, also three other levels. Uh, so at a regional level, um, with uh, three other uh, so besides Wageningen, you have three other municipalities, surrounding municipalities that are working together in what what is also called Food Valley at a regional uh, scale. Uh, so they are um, uh, yeah of course they are also including a lot of. Uh, other agricultural companies, especially also a lot of farmers that are uh, farming around here. Um, and they are really focusing on strengthening the regional uh, economy, creating jobs uh, and, and that kind of things. But um, yeah, sometimes we can also look at Food Valley uh, from a larger perspective. And uh, there are also uh, many other sites in our country. And our country is actually very small. So if you talk about Food Valley, you can easily say, well, Food Valley is also the whole of the Netherlands. Uh, but of course, we have also specific uh, sites, uh, for example, in the southwest, where there's a lot of greenhouse and, and horticulture. Uh, and there we have also uh, parts of, of Wageningen uh, working together with other uh, companies. Uh, and, and then we call them, for example, green ports that are yeah, uh, hubs in itself also, but they are also connected through this whole concept of, of food valley. And I think that's basically the 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 the, the corridor. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, as you know, we we are also part of Europe, and we do a lot of research projects through European funding. Uh, so yeah, also through European funding, uh, we create also a lot of connections to other uh, hubs. Uh, so especially, for example, in a recent project that I'm also coordinating, smart agri hubs, uh, we have more than uh, 400 digital innovation hubs uh, connected uh, through this uh, project. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the food valley at different, from different. Well, so much, so much stuff going on there. It's 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 really fascinating. Hey, Lenore, I, I mean, I know that you've traveled around the world studying sort of food hubs, uh, written a lot about them. What 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 what, what from what Jacques just described is happening in the Netherlands strikes you as similar or different to like like other food hubs that you've um, you've encountered, say in in Singapore or, or even in British Columbia. It's a great question, Evan, and I might even expand it a little bit in that the first time I really saw innovation in action was when I finished my physics degree and had no real idea what to do with my life. I moved to San Francisco in the mid to late 90s um, during the dot com boom when a whole bunch of people were trying to figure out what to do with the Internet. Could this thing be useful for anything? And it was a bit of an open question still. They had four things in my mind that made an astounding, um, almost unprecedented in human history burst of innovation. They had uh, academics in terms of Berkeley and Stanford, um, lots of companies from startups to bigger companies that were better established that had been there for a while in the Silicon Valley, um, and thus a lot of people. And they had governments that were largely out of the way, but were providing sort of a good environment, and they had space. In that, from the moment I arrived in San Francisco, I was being shuttled from party to party to coffee shop to business to meeting where the same people were networking and coming together and bouncing ideas. And the truth is nine out of 10 of those ideas were terrible, but there were so many of them. And I really think, and I agree strongly with Hannah and her, her brilliant presentation, we are entering probably the most exciting decade in agriculture in the last 10,000 years in my mind. And uh, I see what happened in Silicon Valley back in those glorious 90s happening in agriculture. And so my answer to that, it's the same four ingredients we need. And I've seen that in, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in Singapore, and also, of course, in the Netherlands with their golden triangle model of government support. And the Netherlands outright say, we've picked top sectors, they call them, that we're going to support heavily. We're going to be experts in that. They don't try and give a little bit of money to everyone, which is a Canadian flaw, in my opinion. They say, yeah, ag tech, we're going to do horticulture, we're going to do ag tech, we're putting money into it. Um, really solid universities, the Wageningen being, of course, the answer, but in Canada, we do have Guelph. And um, then, yeah, then, of course, also you have the businesses, and they're tightly tied in. 
And when I look at hubs and I look at Guelph, which is definitely emerging as a hub, one of the strengths there is the OMAFRA agreement with the provincial government that funnels money in, but it's directed by business to a degree. So it's not that the professors can just wander around willy-nilly spending it. They have to actually be solving problems industry has. And we see that in these leading hubs. And I would say there are these few, um, the Netherlands, of course, leading, but Singapore, Israel coming up fast, Taiwan, um, a few locations in China, and weirdly enough, the good old Silicon Valley, because the same ingredients are still there, that same mixing of people. And I think that's it. Those four ingredients really make a tech All right, I'm, I'm going to push back a little tiny bit and pitch to Jacques on this one, because Jacques, I know I've read from you or discussed with you in the past that you think that one of the things that's distinctive about uh, the experience that you've been undertaking with the Food Valley in the Netherlands is that people in the leadership role have, in your opinion, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, taken a leadership role or a strong views around environmental sustainability, the ethics of artificial intelligence, um, other issues that maybe I would consider social and environmental justice related. So, uh, you know, have I, have I misinterpreted you, first of all? And, and if so, I apologize. But I don't think I have because I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before. So maybe you can you can riff on what Lenore just said and and add that social and an environmental justice development element. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, we call it sometimes uh, the the Wageningen approach. And um, uh, indeed, uh, there are also several other hubs around the world and in Singapore, Israel, Tokyo um, uh, that are comparable. Uh, but um, yeah, I think um, they are. Uh, and also, what we saw in the first two brilliant presentations anyway, but it's, you see, it's always a, a lot of focus on the technology itself. And uh, what we try to do is to uh, approach this also in a, a very multidisciplinary way uh, through uh, things like multi-actor approaches. And I saw also in the chat, uh, the public-private partnerships, uh, including all the different stakeholders. Uh, but then, of course, it's still uh, a matter of how, how do you organize and how do you support it? Uh, so not only in a technical sense, uh, but we are also very much um, yeah, approaching from a socioeconomic uh, perspective. Uh, so indeed, um, uh, we do uh, also emphasize a lot of um, um, uh, disciplines or also support uh, projects with disciplines from socio sociology, uh, anthropo anthropology, and that kind of uh, direction. So, and, and we do that really in an integrated way. And, and maybe, yeah, we distinguish ourselves with that. Um, and beside that, of course, we are still very good and in, in, in increasing production and that kind of things. But yeah, we are also looking at the other sides. All right. I want to pick up on what you just said, because I find this sort of the the the, um, uh, the Wagenin approach that you just mentioned so fascinating. But I also I want to layer in a bit of what Lenore said. And this is a conversation I've had with with both of you in the past where, I mean, we all know that um, there's often a divide between, uh, say, academic research at universities that puts a huge priority on sort of knowledge and scientific publications and, and the sort of traditional academic stuff, and the applied research that comes out of industry that really is about bringing ideas to market and um, doesn't really care about impact factors and citation rates and science and nature publications. So my, my sense is that, um, that, that you folks in, in the Netherlands, Jacques, have been pretty successful at, at bridging that divide. Um, and, and Lenora, you've you know, straddled both of these worlds for much of your career. So I, I know there's people on the call who are straddling that career, maybe early career scientists, and, and you know, starting with Jacques and then to Lenore, any, any advice on managing this sort of the different expectations? If we need the university and the industry to work together, how do we overcome those, um, those different barriers that we experience when we try to bring that, those two cultures of research together? So, so Jacques, maybe you want to jump on that one and then, and then Lenore. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. And I think it's not only a Dutch uh, thing, so not only in the Netherlands, I think also in the, in the whole of the, the European Union, uh, we are um, yeah, focusing a lot on how can you connect uh, this more fundamental research on the one side and the more applied research at the, at the other side by um, yeah, aligning and combining the funding um, instruments. Uh, so Lenore was already uh, pointing at this top sector uh, approach. So, of course, we get a lot of money directly from the Ministry of Agriculture or, or Ministry of Science to do to the research in education. 
uh, but also a substantial part of the, the money, money is used for innovation. And that goes through these top sectors where the businesses are really in the lead, um, but they have to submit a proposal uh, together uh, with us, uh, with, the, with the researchers. So already yeah, through these uh, funding mechanisms, uh, you are forced to, to really work together and to come up with a satisfying uh, proposal and, and also approach uh, for both the uh, yeah the, the funding the funder the government but also of course for the for the industrial or the private parties that are in, involved. Lenore, what you want to jump in on this one? I know I know you've got opinions on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'll I'll try and keep that into a small conversation. We could probably hold a seminar on this. I very strongly feel Canadian universities have to get better at this. And they have to put resources into helping professors learn to bridge these worlds. I mean, I'm lucky in that I've spent parts of my life in both worlds. And so I know a little bit about how it works. But there can be jarring problems in that business works at a very different pace than academia. Um, and of course, also intellectual property is treated very differently in the two worlds. Um, I would say, though, that a lot of that is technical. And I, my university has been very supportive uh, because we do like applied research that is you know, topical to our region. And so it's been a little easier for me because I am at a smaller regional university. I would say though, that there is also a philosophical issue that needs to be addressed in that there is in some parts of academia, an opinion that, um, that these things are bad, that uh, I have been told many times I've sold out. I don't ever really remember signing on for something that I could sell out of. And clearly I'm setting my price too low too, I would say. <laughs> um, but I've been told I've sold out or that I'm picking sides or the one I love is that my writing is too approachable because I write for trade press and you can buy my book, you know, on BC ferries, for example, and sit and read it, and it's not full of you know citations. And so the way we value academic input, I think our output does need to change in Canada if we're to get you know very well versed at this, bridging this world. But I would say I think it's getting easier for professors to engage with industry. So I'm gonna end on an optimistic note and say I think it is a direction academia needs to pursue and uh, they need to put resources into. All right, I, I mean, we've got a, only got a few minutes left and I'd, I'd like to encourage us to get sort of pointy in our recommendations. You know, what, what two or three recommendations uh, do you think you would like to leave, you know, aspiring would be ag tech hub innovation hubs with based on your experiences in the Netherlands or your experience, Lenore, uh, on the West Coast? Uh, it's very hard to reproduce something like the University of Guelph's relationship with the Ontario government. It's a wonderful cornerstone of, of my institution, but it's, it's hard to wave your magic wand and suddenly have a, a, a close, productive, uh, well-funded relationship with a provincial government. So, so what sort of things could, a, could a, a, a person like Gavin who wants to build or bootstrap something like this up in a, in a region, what, what, what could he do? And, and maybe, maybe we should talk about land, labor, and capital as sort of the, the, the kinds of ways that we need to be thinking of. Jacques, what, what do you think? You know, any advice for Gavin? <laughs> Oh, well, I think Gavin is already doing a very good job. So one of the recommendations um, uh, when we talk about this, these, these attack clusters and this digital, uh, uh, digital transformation or innovation um, is creating the right ecosystems uh, and also a, a sustainable ecosystem. So uh, also my own institute, we have to work uh, by projects. Uh, so every time we have to start up a new project and it ends. Uh, but I can say that through all these projects, we are creating a sustainable and, and uh, structural ecosystem of different players, like Gavin was showing also in this, this picture. So I think uh, that's very important. Um, at the same time, I think uh, and that's also, also in, the, in the presentation of Gavin, <clears throat> there's nowadays a lot of attention paid to the, yeah, let's say the higher TRL levels where all, all the incubators and accelerator programs are. Uh, Sorry, Jack, can you startups. just define TRL for a much, I I'm not sure everyone will know exactly what that means. Yeah, so it's a te technology readiness level. So uh, the startups are uh, typically working at uh, the higher TRL level. So they are all 
yeah, they think at least they are already uh, going to the market. And at the other side, you have the more fundamental uh, research or technology readiness levels. And um, what I wanted to, to, to say as a recommendation is that it is really necessary also to very much focus in this middle. Um, and it has all to do with the, the investors that are behind it. Uh, so if we talk about real fundamental research, there is, of course, a lot of public funding usually available and it's easy or relatively easy to get it. And then at the other side, uh, as was pointed out by Hannah, I think there are a lot of uh, investors ready to uh, put a lot of money into these uh, startups. Uh, but I think especially in the middle where there are good ideas and good prototypes uh, to scale them up. Um, yeah, that's that's really uh, very difficult. So uh, that's also still a challenge, I think, for here in the Netherlands or in Europe uh, to, to work on that. We are trying to do that, and especially, for example, in a, in a recent project, uh, the Internet of Food and Farm 2020, we were really uh, working uh, in this area. Uh, but yeah, it also requires a, a specific approach, uh, which is different from the startup approach, for example. And so that, that would be yeah, one of my main recommendations to, yeah, to see if you can bridge this gap you can also indicate it as the value of death or twilight zone or whatever name uh, but that's really uh, really uh, very important i think all right so that's a good description of the enabling structures that help bring a technology out of low technology readiness levels up to more advanced ones uh lenore over over to you and, and maybe you know land and labor i mean are often seen as as two limiting factors here, uh, not having access to the right kind of labor. And then the fact that ag tech, is it industrial? Is it agricultural? We, we, it sort of falls into some weird gray areas. Either of those topics you want to bat, bat at? Yes, and I would say that to me, the single biggest obstacle in Canada and particularly in British Columbia is our policy is designed for yesterday's agriculture. And uh, we need so just, just make that more a little more real for us. What do you mean? Um, so, for example, um, if uh, I'm working with a company that wants to grow strawberries indoors, which in Canada is a great idea because we can only grow strawberries for about a month or two. And uh, the problem is they can't site their facility on industrial land. Number one, it's too expensive. Number two, most municipalities don't allow agriculture on industrial land. However, they also in British Columbia can't site their facility on agricultural land because um, the rules around agricultural land were designed for 50 years ago when you couldn't grow strawberries inside. So they're not on the list of allowed uses. It's this kind of thing that sends companies elsewhere. And that's my big worry is that Canada has to realize we're in a competition and that losing actually has repercussions. And I was, I was chatting with a CEO in Silicon Valley and I asked him bluntly, I said, can Canada, can we be leaders in ag tech? And uh, he was in the cellular agricultural area. And I was like, can we be leaders? And he said to me, yes, you should be dominant, but you won't be because of your government red tape and policies. Until you move that along, you're gonna always have one leg behind, tied behind your back. And that's really stuck with me and it's haunted me. And as you know, I put a lot of my own time uh, and even my free time into trying to move this forward and build an environment where this kind of agriculture can flourish. Because just to round that off is um, when I look say at um, our biggest industry in BC um, in terms of export, which is blueberries, that industry only works as long as the rest of the world wants our fruit. If around the world groups are trying to grow blueberries indoors, eventually they will succeed and they will become cheaper then field grown blueberries and available fresh locally all year round, great win all around. If we don't adapt to try and get ahead of these things, we'll be playing catch up and our industries will watch their market evaporate and we'll have to buy technology from other people to even produce. And we won't be competing, we'll just be catching up. So I think our critical element is really really pushing policy change to allow for agritech to advance so Canada can take its rightful place as a global leader because 
if Canada can't lead in agriculture, we're really doing something wrong because <laughs> we should be one of the great producers. And to be honest, I'm always a little ashamed when I realized how badly the Netherlands is is winning. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I have, I, I have to say, and I'm always just blown away by what happens there and how great their model is and that golden triangle of academy and industry and government. And I just look at us and I think, boy, we have we have one of the world's biggest land masses. We can grow almost anything. We got all this tech, all this free energy. We need to make sure that we, we win. And, all right. Um, I, thanks, Lenore. Sorry, I just cut you off that. Sorry, apologies. Um, I, I think we're out of time though. So uh, I'm gonna just simply very quickly wrap up. And I, I think, you know, I speak for all of us on this panel, Hannah and Gavin as well, that agriculture really, is at a pitiful moment. Uh, Lenore, you said it was the most exciting decade in 10,000 years. It sounds about right to me. Uh, and I, you know, I feel that just as, you know, ride sharing has um, fundamentally rewritten the rules of the economies around transportation or video streaming has done the same for home entertainment. I, I think the technologies that Hannah in particular described so, so well for us really do herald the change that, you know, maybe the, the same level of, or the same scale of change is coming to food and farming systems. And I share your optimism, uh, both of you and, and the other panelists, that properly done these technologies can drive not only innovation and economic growth, but environmental improvements as well. Um, and and I, I, I share that, that hope that, uh, that maybe Canada can, can one day sort of arrive at the same level that the Netherlands seems to have done by, by, by creating a, a priority by the highest level of government and filtering it through to the levels of government um, to, uh, to, 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 to incubate the sort of innovations we're talking about. But with that, uh, we, are, we are now uh, out of time. So I will say thank you to the organizers for giving us the platform and the, and the opportunity. And I'll turn it back over to the host. There we go. Uh, thank you so much, Evan. And thank you, that panel. You're amazing. It was an amazing uh, discussion. We've got lots of questions in the Q&A section. That was great. I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Fraser, Dr. Wolfert, and Dr. Neiman for that. Um, so remember, in the chat section, we do have their information that has been put up if you want more on the panelists, but also you can go to cityage.com on this event page. You can link on there and see bios for everybody from today's event, including myself. And we will be having the video up later. Look back next week for that. So let's look at the results from our last poll. It'll pop up on your screen. It looks like the majority of you voted for the private and public sectors to work together to lead the way to making Canada an agritech superpower. Uh, we do have another poll question for you that will pop up on your screen and uh, take a look at what is the biggest trend in food we need to be aware of. Make your decision, click on the links, and then we will be uh, revealing the answers as we go throughout the episode. Now, our next presenter will probably answer this poll question actually with the move to sustainability in the global food system. Dr. Robert Newell is an expert in this subject. He's an associate director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at University of Fraser Valley and an adjunct faculty in the School of Environment and Sustainability, Royal Roads University. Uh, Robert, what do you think and where do we stand on the issue of sustainability? Great. Um, yeah, are we ready to um, share my screen and I can go ahead? Absolutely. Hit uh, share screen and it should pop up for everybody to see. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm just going to, we can, we can uh, see my, my slide presentation. Um, I'm assuming yes. So uh, yes, today, it's in presenter I, mode. Okay. Sorry. It is perfect. We see it clearly. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so what I'm actually going to talk about today is a, uh, a research project um, that the Food and Agriculture Institute did um, in uh, partnership with the Abbotsford Text District. Um, I'm the associate director of the Food and Agriculture Institute. You just heard from Lenore Newman, this, who's the director. This research project also involves Jofia Mendeli Zambo, uh, Catherine Newman, and Charmaine White, the research assistants. Um, and in partnership with the Abbotsford Tech District, what we looked at was the, um, uh, the role of incubators and accelerators in terms of what it can do for food and farm systems in Canada. So specifically what we're doing was we're um, examining the uh, 
uh, a research question was, what are the challenges and opportunities around really building incubator and accelerator capacity, uh, specifically for bolstering agricultural innovation and technology in Canada to contribute to sustainable uh, Canadian food systems and um, better uh, food economies in the country? This is um, to say that, uh, well, we, we do actually have incubator and accelerator programs in Canada that work in this space and those that actually um, support that don't necessarily focus on this space, but support uh, agricultural technology and innovation. This particular project looked at uh, what we can do in order to enhance this uh, and uh, go forward with this agenda. Um, the, the project itself that we did in partnership with the Tech District uh, applied the findings to the Fraser Valley specifically, but I'm going to be talking more about the deep dive into the, um, uh, the broader context of what this can do for um, Canadian food systems. Now, I just want to give you a little bit of context and the objectives of the research. Um, we uh, Another project that was um, led by the Food and Agriculture Institute, uh, but also done in partnership with Evan Fraser's team, uh, it was a review-based paper that looked at this thing that we're referred to as the agricultural dilemma. Uh, so this is sort of a foundational idea for what we're looking at in, um, in terms of uh, enhancing incubator accelerator capacity in the agri-tech space. What you see below this diagram, it uh, more or less captures the dilemma, and you've heard this through uh, the last panel, and you've kind of heard this through uh, Hannah's presentation too, so I'm just going to capture this pretty quickly. Um, what we have uh, generally in the, the discourse around food systems is two major models, two major paradigms of how agriculture is done. You have that large-scale conventional agriculture that is tech-driven, produces a lot of food, um, but also creates some challenges uh, in terms of social environmental factors. And then on the other side, you have this thing that often people refer to as alternative agriculture, which is more the organic approach. It's uh, decentralized, um, has a lot of social and environmental benefits, but it has challenges around uh, the, food, the, the amount of food production, as well as the high labor costs and needs. So in this paper, we're kind of talking about this third approach, um, looking at the emerging agriculture technologies and innovations, and how can it borrow from both sides uh, and try and uh, like optimize it basically you uh, harness the benefits of this agri-tech um, in order to create a localized production through vertical farming, cellular agriculture, and that sort of thing. So you can uh, have low environmental footprints and shorten those supply chains. So that's kind of a foundational idea, but then there's these other things that happen that kind of made this research important and uh, worthwhile to do. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a lot of the discourse around food security, well, increased around our concerns around food security and food systems. And uh, what we saw is despite the economic challenges in 2020, there has been there was an uptick in investment in agriculture startups. Uh, some of the estimates I saw were something like 30, 35% more than what was seen in 2019. Then there's these other things, um, factors. Uh, going to the Canadian context, so as uh, Lenore was chatting about, uh, we, we do actually have the potential to be among agri-tech leaders. We've got a strong agricultural tech sector. We've got a lot of great research institutions in Canada, um, but we don't follow among these uh, these leaders and early doctors like the United States, Netherlands, Israel, Singapore, these countries that you've heard about a lot today. But then there's this other element too that uh, um, accelerators and incubators have shown to contribute to Canadian innovation and economy. In 2019, there was this study, a uh, report by Stats Canada that said that, um, or they surveyed uh, startups and they said that um, something along the lines of 75, 76% of them uh, that have gone through these programs said it was vital to their success or significantly contributed to it. So we're looking at this, uh, this idea here that this could actually contribute to Canada being a potential leader. So here's our research question. What are the opportunities and challenges around increasing agri-tech incubator and accelerator capacity in Canada? Before we get into the actual research, um, I'm going to use the term agriculture incubator and accelerator in sort of a collective fashion, but it's worthwhile to note that they're different things. Um, incubators uh, are more targeted towards the early business sta the stages of businesses, these, these early ideas um, and uh, um, pushing the force help them evolve. Accelerators kind of help at later stages, getting these uh, businesses more into the commercial market. Uh, there are key elements of them, and this is from the literature. Uh, Schwartz sort of describes these five key elements of, for incubators incubators being it's got to be credible, it's got to have that sort of a credibility to it um, for the startups. Networking is key, that's going to come up a lot. Uh, subsidized rental space, collective shared facilities for research and development, and business assistance. That comes up a lot in this presentation because a lot of these folks are coming from STEM backgrounds that are starting startups. 
And then the accelerator side, similar sort of um, uh, elements like mentorship, uh, networking, um, but then there's also these other elements around scaling up. So investment, providing more office space, that branding and legitimization to get these companies into the, the market. The perspective and approach are different. Um, the incubators, uh, this, is, this is from our, um, our conversations with people working in this space. Incubators are often uh, kind of perceived as there for the societal good and they're often not for profit. So getting technologies that can help society. Accelerators have more of an investment focus. Uh, often accelerators will take some seed money for equity and then key benefits and functions. And this also comes from our conversations with people in these space. Um, uh, some people that have gone through this program said that incubators were great for networks knowledge uh, and the setup around things like the counting, legal, finding government incentives, some of those things that are less exciting than the tech itself, uh, whereas accelerators are great for the scaling up, funding, getting a good business case for your product, and finding target markets. So with that said, uh, I'm going to the last uh, five slides here are just going to talk about the research. Uh, our research methods um, we took a pretty standard interview format. So we um, interviewed academics, um, incubator accelerator advisors, investors, uh, people that work in sort of incubator accelerator programs or programs that are similar to that, and startups. Uh, these are specifically people that were um, in uh, related to incubators and accelerators, and also in the agricultural space in Canada. So um, we kind of targeted those folks. Uh, for those that aren't that familiar with qualitative methods, we used a coding approach, which um, uh, essentially means that we tagged different el uh, elements of the transcript data with different themes, started with an open coding, which is more of a free form, looking at those emergent themes, something like 50 codes came out, there are things like economic development, GHG emissions, consumer market, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we went through a selective coding process, which was more targeted. So this is uh, where we had a framework of the things we uh, wanted to categorize the data in. And this is around the opportunities for increasing incubator accelerator capacity, the success factors for making this happen, um, challenges around doing this in Canada, and uh, actions for overcoming these challenges. And looking at this, uh, this diagram down at the bottom, what you're going to notice is that the opportunities and success factors are kind of broadly applicable to incubators and accelerators and broadly applicable to food systems. Success factors are really more broadly applicable to incubators, accelerators. But once we get into the challenges and actions and approaches, then that's where you're going to start seeing things that are more specific to Canadian food systems. So these last four slides are just on the results of this analysis here. Um, the opportunities are, uh, the first one was interesting enough, it was uh, not super explicitly stated, but it was very much prevalent in there that uh, the incubators and accelerators do actually have the, uh, the ability to contribute to sustainable and competitive food systems through things like mission, value, and the criteria for who they accept in those programs. So having that, uh, they, there's actually a sort of a selection of which technologies they, they can support. And uh, um, some of these criteria uh, what we've seen involves things like the things that uh, contribute to climate adaptation, uh, environmental resource efficiency, food security, uh, as you imagine. But then also on the economic side, uh, things that produce clean technology jobs, things that help the economic viability of farmers too. So looking at that kind of economic side of our food systems. The other uh, element of uh, one of the big opportunities in this day and age is harnessing creativity. You know, talking to folks in the academic sector, uh, notice that the modern student culture is really conducive towards the development of startups. So people are looking at this as a viable career path to um, you know, express their creativity and explore new ideas. Also, we found that there are virtual engagement opportunities, particularly the pandemic has shown us, that's what we're seeing nowadays. Uh, this is great for connecting groups and organizations across geographically vast areas like Canada. It's not a substitute for the physical space, but what it does is it allows to kind of break over um, some of the silos that we might see and allow for more knowledge sharing and collaboration around innovation. Um, also, incubators and accelerators are good for considering different aspects of uh, food value chains from you know, the production across to the processing of foods. You can develop these networks so you can identify roles of different startups and companies for uh, fitting them within this value chain and where they might uh, be able to work with the industry partners. Success factors, like I say, a lot of this is going to be broadly um, applicable to uh, incubators and accelerators, but some of it's around food systems too. So the network formation comes up all the time. This is a major uh, success factor. If you have good capacity to, to create good networks, then huge, that's very, very much lends to the success of these systems. Connecting uh, startups with mentors and investors, people in the industry space. But then looking at the, that food systems aspect too, it's uh, great to connect uh, startups with different industry folks that um, could 
complement each other in the value chain. So example is a, a company that only just involved a couple people that were working in around seed breeding. Uh, were well connected with someone that uh, a larger company that was working in the alternative protein space. So really good complementarity there. Now uh, types of mentorship and support. So the mentorship uh, from business investors was noted as quite useful for people going through the programs. I also noted legal business and administrative for, uh, support. This is harkens back to the fact that a lot of these people are coming from the STEM background, so it's good to go give those supports. Advisory committees, uh, the, it's great to compose them of technical and scientific expertise and business expertise, um, uh, sort of similar to the last point I made. And now this part's important, if included, multiple academic connections, uh, not just necessarily tied to one university, and we'll talk a little bit more that, about that in the next few slides. Alignment with policy, it's really good um, when uh, incubators and accelerators uh, think forward about how they can position startups for funding and assess the, the kind of needs for industry. So industries that um, uh, or have requirements to reduce the GHG emissions, then they can help startups connect these uh, um, and position them well for funding and, uh, and investments and um, working with industries. Uh, so sufficient seed funding, developing an incubator space of an adequate size, both in physical space and activity, um, particularly important for the agricultural sector around that physical space. It requires a lot of physical space, but basically it's almost a non-starter. This was the point made that if you have an incubator that's too small, uh, there's no magic number, but 50,000 square foot was uh, something that came through our data. The other element is around activity. So this is uh, around the, the number of startups, the, uh, the people that are involved in the network. This is good for the process of the incubator but and accelerators but it's also good for investors they kind of like to see that the fact that there's there's some buzz and activity and energy going into this space affiliation and visibility so uh, pretty simple points um having a good affiliation and having affiliation with universities or credible incubators are good for legitimacy and also having connections to media is good for publicizing these programs and uh and the startups and companies and success metrics uh you get what you measure um it's tempting to measure these success in terms of number of startups going through but that's not really that useful of metric it's uh, good to look at successful businesses over the years and the value return to the agricultural sector just a couple more slides. So um, now we're going to talk about challenges. And this is where we start getting into more of the Canadian context and Canadian food system. So uh, one big challenge is uh, venture cultural cap uh, capital culture. In Canada, it was noted to be more risk averse than in places in the United States, and particularly in agritech. Um, this is uh, expensive stuff with long and unclear return on investments. You know, you, you can think about things like uh, digital data management. It's kind of hard to really get a full sense of that return on investment. Um, perspective on agriculture, and this was uh, uh, handled a little bit in um, the, the last panel, but there's uh, agriculture, there's certain perceptions around it. Uh, could be perceived in Canada through a welfare lens um, in terms of, you know, given uh, the, the regulatory environment around, it's more of kind of something like a social good and not necessarily a wealth creator. And also low tech, uh, maybe through this a rural gaze, so to speak. Um, so not as a dynamic tech environment. So that could be challenging for attracting investment. University affiliation, this is a funny one because um, there is a lot of use of, time, uh, um, of establishing incubators in, uh, in universities for accessing the resources, but you don't necessarily want to be tied to one university, right? Because then you're tied to their universities and programs uh, through our data, and I actually saw in the chat too, um, colleges and universities do different things. So it's good to be able to have access to different programs and not be tied to a single one. Attacking and attracting and retaining companies and talent um, is noted that the regulatory pathways in Canada um, uh, can be challenging and confusing. And also we have some challenges in attracting places, certain tech in different provinces. Uh, some provinces are might be at a bit of a disadvantage just because of things like energy costs. Uh, silos, so uh, noted about we have uh, geographical silos with different uh, agricultural systems you see in different provinces across the way. Uh, and also silos in governance. Um, and uh, this is in terms of departments. And it's the idea of uh, who's going to fund this, who's going to support this. Are these ministries and departments that are around innovation, the economy, agriculture, a little bit of both. It requires a lot of discussion among these groups, among across these silos. Uh, just a couple more points here. There's um, also this challenge specifically around food. There's a societal expectation for affordable food, but that re requires scaling up uh, to create this affordable food, and that's very expensive and challenging to do for uh, startups, and um, that's also then challenges for the accelerators that are supporting the startups. Uh, the diversity agriculture tech, um, this is an interesting one, because what is agriculture technology, right? It could be an online platform for sharing data. Uh, it could be, as you see over these uh, images on the right, it could be drones, 
It could be lab space for creating food, like cellular food. What is it? So it's specialized and expensive equipment, and it requires different funding sources and different expertise. This is my final slide here. Um, just action and approaches for moving forward. Uh, a lot of these actions and approaches are things that have been implemented, but just like recommendations for perhaps for exploring them further. De-risking the investment. So this could be um, uh, government policies that uh, open markets for agri-tech agri par uh, products and kind of make them more attractive. Uh, we talked about things, policies that kind of incentivize clean technologies, um, as well as providing tax breaks and incentives. Uh, reduce reliance on private capital and more public investment. You'll notice in parentheses here, I have infrastructure because there's a really neat point that I wanted to feature here that you kind of got to look at this more, less, uh, less so much of an investment in economies from, or sorry, uh, uh, businesses from the government perspective and more an investment in food security infrastructure over the long term. Regulatory guidance, develop and promote resources that provide sort of clear pathways and guidance from concept to market. Network diversity. So the major point here is include multiple post-secondary institutions in an incubator and accelerator networks. So this is not to say that you can't have a, a university that supports this sort of thing and uh, provides a lot of space for it, but it is good to look at the, uh, the full broader scene of the colleges uh, and universities that do different things and how you can connect them and get involved, um, give opportunities for their students and you know harness that innovation. Also a quick point, uh, we heard from some people that went through the programs, involve a variety of mentors. Um, they heard that, um, you know, without being too critical, the, there's a lot of mentors that were people that went through the startup program. They like to hear more from more people that were in the industry on a long-term basis. National Hub, this is great. Uh, creating a single national hub for supporting agriculture research, connecting actors, networks of networks. So really just something that connects the networks right across the, the, the country. Sharing knowledge and this neat point around directing investment. So people that want to invest in this space, they have a one-stop shop to figure out what's actually going on in Canada rather than going across this geographically vast country in various spots to try and get a like a you know disconnected view of our, our agricultural scene, our technology scene. Program specialization, it's good to identify needs and supports for different areas of agri-food technology and innovation. Um, you see this with incubators that work in different spaces like the Mars incubator uh, that has uh, different programs for finance technology um, and health technology, right? You can really sort of be specialized and the idea of saying the, that you can have maybe perhaps incubators that really kind of specialized crafts in the cellular agriculture space. And then with the national hub, they can actually direct uh, startups and investors to these different uh, specialties and these different types of uh, uh, programs. And my final point for today is international networks. Um, it's easy to get really domestically focused, particularly since this is a project that was done uh, on the Canadian context, but it is good to have those expand those networks beyond the dom domestic networks to broaden the expertise that you can reach out to investment pools um, and also explore export markets because there are uh, companies that will want to work in the export space. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. And that's the uh, end of the presentation. I also recognize that I'm kind of towards the end of the day. So I just want to leave this uh, website up here. Um, and if I don't get to your questions uh, today, knowing that we're kind of bumping to the end of the session, please do feel free to visit the website and email me. My email's up there. We're also going to post our slides on our website up there too. So yeah, be happy to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert, and thank you for leaving that post up for everybody. Feel free to reach out. Um, you made some excellent points about the challenges, and hopefully we can use that to tackle and turn it into opportunities. Thank you once again. And for you joining us right now, tuning in, you're watching The Future of Food 2.0, Building Agritech Clusters, and I'm your host, Sara Lani. Panelists are in the Q&A section answering specific questions, so head on over there if you do have something specific. Um, and let's take a look at our poll results. So what is the biggest trend in food we need to be aware of? And it looks like half of you say a move to sustainable practices is your choice. And here we have the last uh, poll question that will pop up on your screen momentarily. There it is, you've got four options there. Please make your choice and we will reveal the results as we go through. Now it's time for a robust dialogue on building agritech clusters. In the last two years, venture capitalists have invested over $4 billion in startups. Our next panel will help us understand what it takes to succeed in agritech and what investors are looking for. We have on our panel Stephanie Savoy, an associate of uh, Bordner Ladner Gervais, an expert in merger and acquisitions. 
Zach McDonald, the Director of Operations and Talent with Milk Movement, a North American-wide dairy supply chain uh, software. Gavin Dew, the Chief Strategic Advisor to Abbotsford Tech District, who we've heard speak earlier in the episode. Also joining the panel is Colby Nickel, the Director of Capital Enablement at Emily. He has spent over 10 years focused on growing precision agriculture internationally, integrating technology on farms and within the value chain. The panel moderator, moderator is Jason Bradley, the manager of strategic partnerships at Olds College. He has held roles in tech, manufacturing, cattle ranching, telecommunications, and academia. Thank you to our panel for being here. And uh, Jason, I'll let you take it away. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, that uh, I have pages full of notes here from the last bit. So it's been, um, I think, really fitting. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so uh, I'm looking forward to this panel discussing some of the things that, um, that maybe bring it down um, a little bit to the ground level where some of, the, some of the startups and some of the folks going through incubators and accelerators and whatnot are working on. And so, um, and so we're gonna start with Stephanie. And uh, when we were chatting the other day, Stephanie, um, you know, we were talking about in your practice, you work lots with early stage startups and helping them through those beginning stages um, of, of, you know, early on uh, where they might be in a pre-accelerator or an accelerator or an incubator. Um, and, so, and so at that stage, what, what should those folks be looking for um, uh, in terms of funding and in terms of those kind of things in terms of your practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have two main things that I wanted to, to chat about uh, in terms of what you should do before looking for funding. Um, and the first is really knowing how you're going to articulate the monetization of your business and how you're going to communicate that to investors. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's really what they're looking to know. And, and you understanding that and having a, a good understanding of how you're going to communicate that is going to give investors comfort. Um, the second main thing that I wanted to talk about was really having your house in order right from the get-go. Um, and what I'm specifically referring to, particularly in agritech, is to ensure that you have the proper IP assignment agreements in place and ensure that the company that you're raising money into is actually the holder of the asset. Um, so I know that sometimes when we're in early stage startups, um, you kind of, you may be with a buddy or, or somebody that you know that are, you're working together to, to create a product or an idea and um, you don't always transfer that, that IP that goes with those ideas and with that product into the company. And ultimately that's what investors are going to be looking for is that the, the value of that IP rests with the company. Um, so I won't go into it too much because I know that there's a, a, a number of folks on the panel, but to the extent that anybody wanted to discuss that further or had questions, be happy to take that offline. Okay, um, and so Stephanie, in terms of the investors and, and, and what they're looking for um, in a startup, what, what's some of your experience in terms of what those investors are looking for? So you talked about, you know, how some of that IP should be in place. And so are they looking for some of those specifics or are they looking for other things from the startup companies? Yeah, I mean, it's it really comes down to where the value rests with the company, which is why that IP piece is so important, um, which also ties into how you're going to monetize that, right? Um, and so ultimately, it's really, the investors want to know how that IP is going to be monetized at the end of the day, particularly with ag tech. Um, the other thing that I, I should have mentioned before was, uh, you know, Another piece that's been really hot, a topic that's been hot lately is uh, environmental, social, and, and governance factors, those ESG factors. And I think there's real opportunity with uh, agritech companies and agribusiness generally to highlight those ESG factors um, to make those appealing to investors because it's something that really, uh, I think investors are looking to diversify their portfolios and, and uh, ESG is becoming more and more important. And I think agritech is an opportunity to, to really highlight some of those ES, ESG things that, uh, that investors investors are looking for. So this is an interesting uh, spot I want to stop on quick and maybe open it up to, to the rest of the panel. So um, I spend a lot of time between sectors, the sectors of, of agriculture and ag tech and energy. And there is a lot of discussion, you know, from the energy side of things as they're trying to determine what their ESG goals are and how to meet them and how to look for some of those things like offset credits and whatnot that can help them uh, on that side of things. So 
So what are what are what are other panelists seeing in terms of that? Um, what agriculture can provide to the companies that are looking to, and even as a startup, right? So what kind of things should they be talking about or quantifying as to what they can do to help those others other companies, like let's say from the energy sector, meet their ESG targets? Any thoughts on that? From our perspective, Jason. Um... We, we deal a lot in the, in the U.S. dairy market, and one of their uh, long-term goals uh, by 2050 is to be um, net neutral carbon emissions. And so things that we are doing actually um, on the route optimization side and uh, decreasing what we call empty miles, uh, the amount of uh, miles that uh, milk delivery uh, trucks are driving, um, um, which help decrease greenhouse gas emissions are uh, kind of key in tying in with that mission um, of the industry in the next 20 years or 30 years, I guess. So. Yeah, I'm going to jump in as well, Jason. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for startups, but I think everyone in, in the ag tech industry around, um, like we, we have in Alberta specifically, a, like a very mature carbon market, uh, but what we've seen a huge upswing of the, um, or voluntary market, um, um, unregulated market in carbon. And I think that definitely will see a lot more opportunity. Um, I think we'll see some as well in the, in the regulated markets as well, but there's lots of companies in the service space uh, that are looking at ways to um, increase the efficiency. Cause a lot of times when we look at carbon credits, uh, we see a lot of models where it takes $50 to create $10 of value or vice versa. So it's, it's kind of out of whack where I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, technology specifically and uh, cross pollinating between these two sectors to be able to uh, streamline and create more efficiencies because to that point, there's a lot of number of folks who have made claims around neutrality or to allow, you know, to, to you know, have made claims to get themselves closer to carbon neutral or reducing their footprint. So there's a lot of demand there. I think we need to really focus on the supply side of supporting that technology. Okay. And there's just one thing, I wanna go back to something that, that Hannah talked about at the beginning. So she talked about you know food system disruption. Um, she talked about regenerative agriculture as one of those sort of new nature-based ways for us to look at, at primary production. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about, um, about how agriculture can, can help um, on the carbon side of things where where many parts of the economy are emitters and they're trying their best to look at ways at reducing emissions and being more efficient. And Zach, you talked about how some of that can even happen in the, in the way that your, the logic of your technology works. But, but what about an agriculture can be part of that solution and, and with startups where they can focus on how they can provide um, carbon sequestration through things like regenerative agriculture that can, that can help them to, to um, I would say improve their value proposition early on in their in their startup journey. Any thoughts on that? I I, I could jump in, but guys, definitely go, go ahead. Um, like just quickly, my thought here is um, the the piece from the startup standpoint and being able to increase technology in that space is a lot to do with carbon. Is being able to record it and trace and track all the way through the value system to be able to showcase the the carbon has been created and the practices that go along with it. So you talk about regenerative ag and you talk about a lot of these other, um, I would say, um, philosophies and ideas that have come in. Um, my personal opinion is efficiency is, is really the most important piece to, to yeah. a lot of these things. And you see efficient production usually being um, very environmentally friendly, regenerative and all the rest and, and running their business. So I think any technology that helps to showcase that or helps growers make better decisions to get to their goal is exactly where we want to be going in this route. Okay. Awesome. Okay. We're going to, we're going to jump to Gavin. So Gavin, um, I, I, I feel a little bit, um, a little bit Canadian. Like, I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry that I didn't know more about what you were doing um, in, in Abbotsford and, and the Sumas mountain. It's uh, it's amazing. And, and I say that because of the work that um, I've been privileged to be a part of at, at Olds College and the Smart Farm and, and within the sort of the Calgary region about creating um, an agri-food um, zone in that, in that, in that area. So, so I was super excited to hear what you're doing. And like I have notes, like 
connect with Gavin, talk to Gavin after. So, so um, around what you're doing there, but I want to I want to maybe make it a little bit broader because there's there's pockets throughout the country that are working on creating um, that type of um, agri food zone, um, that type of uh, tech agri tech zone. And so um, I'm thinking of you know what you're doing there around Calgary um, in that region. Uh, there's a there's a group, uh, Pan Canadian Smart Farm Network, that's looking at on the farm side of the, on the on the primary producer side of things. So that includes um, so Lakeland College is contributing to that, and uh, Glacier Farm Media has their Discovery Farm in Langham and Area XO in Ottawa. And so and so with what you're doing in your area, how do you like? We, we all want to make sure that we can focus on creating, um, you know, impact and economic development and, and ag agri-food innovation within a smaller zone. But is there a way to, to do that well and connect across the country? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Jason, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the best agricultural outputs that I'm a big fan of is beer. And that has a really great way of bringing people together to talk about ideas. So uh, you and I will have to get one of those. Uh, but uh, all right. Yeah, so there we go. That, that's how we connect. But but in all seriousness, Jason, um, yes, I believe that a, a really important part of what we're trying to do is connect together different parts of the ecosystem. So, you know, to look to Abbotsford as an example, and the same would be applicable in any jurisdiction, you know, you have a ton of people that are doing amazing things. They're doing innovation. They're thinking about all these things. How do we make sure that we create physical places where they can collide and connect and meet one another in a structured or an unstructured way and form that kind of connective tissue that ties together an ecosystem within a region? And, you know, we're, we're a physically oriented place that's going to do that. But I also very much see the importance, Jason, of being able to, to tie together, whether it's different institutions, different entities, different uh, locations where we're doing this. Ideally, the best case scenario is, you know, if we knit together an effective network of the kinds of organizations you've just talked about, the key is those become the network nodes or the one windows where if I'm uh, if I'm an, uh, an ag operator and I want to do something interesting and I'm looking to find the right people to be innovative with, or if I'm, you know, uh, an innovator with a concept that I'm looking for capital, I'm looking for applications. Ideally, if we get it right, this network becomes the connective tissue by which we're able to knit those things together and help that operator to find the innovator they need help the innovator to find the capital they need. So I, I'm completely with you. We need to figure out how to make sure these things knit together really effectively. Yeah, there's, um, it, it, and we're a big country, right? So I, uh, I'm thinking of what, what uh, Food Valley and Zach, what you've accomplished there. Um, I think part of that is because you get to be so close together. Part of our challenge is we're in so many different growing zones with so many different time zones and just large space. So, so how do you how do we shrink that space? How do we do that uh, without losing sight of developing? Um, you know, because you have a big challenge ahead of you um, to the, you know the, the the Sumas Mountain Project and the and the um, and the Abbotsford Tech District. So how do you shrink that space nationally? Or yeah, let's talk. Let's, let's let's start there. So, how do you shrink that space? How do you do that and still be able to focus on what it is that you need to do in your own um, geographical ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. I mean, part of that I would say applies whether we're talking about ag tech or any other kind of form of of innovation and and connectivity. I think that. Um, there's geographic affinity and there's sectoral or issue-based affinity. And that's where things get really interesting because I think what you can do is you can create a critical mass that is geographic where, you know, for our purposes, it's here is a place. We're flying a big green flag up a flagpole on a mountain and saying, come here, do innovation here, be here, be part of this uh, this energy, this excitement, this opportunity, and you're going to get people there that are coming from all different areas of ag and ag innovation, and even tech outside of ag, that's going to create that critical mass and, and, and get people supported. That also then means once you've got that happening, you start being able to have people that are uh, better equipped or better kind of lifted up to connect on an ideas basis. So how do you build a network that is not just, hey, here's an ag innovation network, but here is a network around 
um, the use of drones or the use of remote sensing or around specific elements of cellular agriculture. So it, to me, it's about how do we make sure we have like those, if you will, vertical and horizontal or, or geographic and affinity or issue based um, forms, forms of connection so people can find one another because often they don't necessarily know one another exist, especially if they're out there in industry. You know, it's one thing to be academic. It's another thing to have a title that has, you know, a specific idea in your, your job title or your department title. It's another thing to be an innovator out there, not realizing that there are 17 other people doing something similar in Canada, but you have no idea they exist because they're out in solitudes. So how do we make it easier for people to discover one another and work together? I think is really important. Yeah, it's it's a question that there's a few of us that have been working on that sort of in our area to create um, uh, a, a, an, a, a digital tool and an ecosystem booster um, capability so that can happen because there are so many people out there that you get, you, you, you have key performance indicators, whether you're a startup or an organization that you're focused on and you don't, Either either you don't even have time to know that there's others that are out there doing the same things, or you know about them, and it's like I have to focus on what I'm focusing on. So, um, so yeah, and I, I it's it reminds me of the word coopetition, and I'm trying yes. to what I'm trying to figure out is how do we do that regionally, um, provincially, and nationally. And so I don't I don't know that we have. We, we all won't have time to answer that question, but maybe I'll leave that more as an, uh, as an open-ended question and even for, for, for folks to chime in on, like, how can we do that? Um, you know, maybe, maybe drop it in the chat or if you have a Q&A question for any one of the panel members. Uh, one, one last quick thing. Gavin, we talked before about um, post-secondary institutions. It's a lot of what your value proposition is. Um, how, do, how do we all, or how do you maybe ensure that, um, that those post-secondaries understand what industry is looking for and through what you're doing, like how do you make sure that they, that they are feeding the right talent into the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. I mean, I, I would say we're really fortunate to be partnered with a fantastic uh, university, the University of the Fraser Valley. They've been just tremendous to work with. And quite honestly, it's not necessarily us telling them, it's them telling us, right? So for our purposes, we know that we're trying to create and animate a specific physical place and we can look at it from more of a market perspective. They can look at it from a post-secondary perspective in terms of uh, uh, the, the teaching and learning component, the research component. We have different knowledge that fits together. I think where it gets really interesting is that you know post-secondary institutions, and I, I, I used to be on the board of one, I used to be on the Senate of one, I've dealt with it from the post-secondary side. Um, really what they need in order to get engaged with the market is more opportunities to get outside of the academic bubble. The best and smartest, you know, uh, academics and post-secondary strategists that I know are the ones that have figured out how to not just be in the academic bubble and figure out how do we interact with industry? How do we do commercialization? How do we create revenue streams? So that's part of why we like what we're doing, because frankly, we're taking a post-secondary component. We're taking it off of campus. We're bringing together different post-secondary institutions and the it, you know we're we're kind of creating an opt-in self-selection vehicle if you will where you know if you want to just be academic that's good that's great we need fundamental researchers that's really critically important but if you want to be academic and innovative and commercial and you want to take what you're doing and apply a commercial lens to it and a, apply an interdisciplinary lens to it uh then great we're here to try to create the crucible within which that that can happen. So it's just creating that opportunity. So, so let me maybe move it over to Zach on that um, in terms of what you're doing at Milk Movement and how are, you, how are you accessing talent? How are you finding the talent that you need for, I would say, you know, maybe, maybe the, the, the new approach um, that you have in terms of your business? How are you finding that talent or how are you telling, you know, post-secondaries, this is what we need? How does that work? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and we've been really fortunate this year. We've, you know, embraced the the fully remote opportunity and, and we've been able to hire, you know, all across Canada, which has been great. Um, we've got some awesome partnerships. We have, you know, we're fortunate to be located with operations here in, in Halifax and St. John. So we've got lots of great opportunity and, and relationships with uh, universities here in the Maritimes. But I think another important um, thing to mention is that 
for not only for us, but I think other companies in our industry and in the ag tech industry as a whole, you know, we're really at the intersection of agriculture and tech. So we are able to pull from, you know, both traditional agriculture sources while also pulling from, you know, post-secondary institutions um, and, you know, able to kind of cross skill, if you will, um, some of the people that we're hiring. Um, another interesting thing that we do is, um, you know, we really double down on, on the co-op opportunities. It's, uh, you know, a low risk, high reward type situation, um, especially when you can get an eight or 12 month student in and uh, with the hope of, you know, keeping them on later on after their uh, internship or co-op term has, has completed. So um, that's, we've been really fortunate to benefit from that. Um, I still feel like Atlanta, Canada's there's a lot of undiscovered talent here. So um, we're, we're going to embrace that and, and hold on to that secret, although it's not much of a secret now. Um, and then the last thing I think that's, you know, that, you know, I will mention that we've gone from our team's gone from 11 to 20 in the last month. And um, I think one of the big um, reasons for that is that we're very candid and we're upfront with, you know, candidates and applicants that we're interviewing that we don't know we don't know what we don't know. Um, we are upfront with them and honest that we are trying to change an industry and it's hard work. And um, we want to make sure that they align with our mission, vision and values. We're very open and honest about those. And uh, it's been very refreshing to get feedback from um, applicants that, you know, they do align with our mission, vision and values. And, you know, they're sustainability is important to them, honesty, collaboration, reliability, open-mindedness, all of these things, they go so far and just, you know, just being able to recruit um, some of the top talent that's out there, not just necessarily in ag tech, but across the board. That's, uh, that's fascinating to hear that affirmation because I, I, I often hear lately the need for um, new grads to have those foundational technical skills but those um, soft skills, if you want to call them, that that you just identified that are really important for them to bring the ability to be you know, adaptable and flexible, to be in line with your mission, vision, and values. Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm very encouraged to hear that that's, that's from your organization, that's some of the things you're looking for, which is mm -hmm. what's helping to give you some, some of the success you've had. So if we can switch gears a little bit, um, it'd be interesting to hear what you think. Is there any one thing that you think has been like the, the secret sauce or what's made the made milk movement the success that it has been? Um, yeah, being Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I so so far we've talked, about, we've talked about milk and beer and a few people have apologized and said, sorry, so we pretty well got it covered. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but there's actually a little bit of truth behind it. Um, and, and it kind of comes from Milk Movement's origin story. So our, one of our co-founders, John, he was, uh, he was working for the Dairy Farmers of Newfoundland. And, and a lot of what we do now, he was doing manually. And, you know, as with any good startup, he figured out a better way to do things. And uh, it kind of took off. And we, you know, it was born out of sort of the Canadian supply management model. Um, mm -hmm. But we're now taking that to the U.S. Um, it's more of a sort of hyper competitive model. Um, but our whole business, you know, I, I mentioned our core values earlier is really rooted in honesty and collaboration and, and real time information sharing. And they've been super receptive to it. And so when I say Canadian, um, I really mean it. Um, they've been very open to this model. They realize that, um, you know, it's, it's helping them, it's helping their stakeholders, it's helping expedite their supply chains. So um, yeah, we're, we're very thankful for that. Okay. So I, I don't have any tattoos yet, but I'm thinking I'm so inspired now. I might get a tattoo with like a, a, a milk cow and a beer bottle over the Canadian flag. <laughs> that might be oh. the unofficial, uh, ag tech ecosystem tattoo or logo. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to see that on me. Um, so uh, a question for the panel. Uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, we talked about ecosystem, um, you know, like regional and provincial and national, 
Um, we talked about sort of the the startup the, and and the services that your firm provides. Stephanie, Zach, you talked about you know a, a new model that you're working on, and you you have a a regional sort of location, but you're scaling to the mm -hmm. U.S. And Colby, you and I are going to talk about something quickly around this. So, so what has the what has the pandemic and what has this new um, model of virtual work or blended work? What does that mean to each of you, or what do you think it means to overall ag tech innovation? Any, anybody want to jump in on that one? Because that's we we've got to deal with it, and we're coming out of it. So, what does it mean? I, I think from my side, it's like the the re, the remoteness of agriculture. We're typically spread out just by the nature of the industry we're in. Has we've always had this to a degree, right? It's it, it's not that we're all you know, downtown in the city, you know, having, you know, in a skyscraper, three or four floors has the whole thing covered. So we're always going to be remote. And I think the, um, like, like two things I think have really come out of this. One is the, the, the emphasis on travel uh, as far as, you know, having, for especially from a startup standpoint, like travel is very expensive and time consuming. So being able to network and move quickly and, and not see as be seen as negative, jumping on a, a zoom call as we are now instead of all being in the same location i think is really mm -hmm. critical um and i think just being able to like lean into that i guess as an industry has been kind of critical so i think that's been the biggest thing for ag tech is, is almost what we were doing before but you know making it a little bit more socially acceptable i guess i think I that's right Go, go ahead, go ahead Stephanie. No, no, no. I'm going to be Canadian. I'll apologize for everybody. Stephanie, you go next. I was just going to say it's more business without borders. Um, it definitely doesn't seem like you need to be in a boardroom to close a deal anymore, which used to be sort of what we would typically see. And now everything's virtual. We don't have uh, any closing rooms or any of those sorts of archaic sort of things that we would typically have in closing investments or M&A deals. So I think it's definitely expanded the scope of you know, who we're participating with and who we're doing deals with. Okay, somebody else. Yeah, I was just gonna say increased opportunities for collaboration. Um, we were also a little bit nervous, I think, being in a traditional industry that dairy is, um, that we weren't going to be able to close deals uh, without being there for, you know, that the handshake, but, you know, they've really embraced it. So it's been, We've, it's been, we've been fortunate. I can, I can add to that. I think, you know, just one, one little nub that has been really significant uh, that I've seen that is affecting ag tech, but also is affecting the way people are thinking. Uh, COVID has really accelerated a lot of changing disruptive business models, particularly on the consumer end of, of the food picture. So, you know, I, I often say it's been a storefront apocalypse. Uh, COVID has brought forth about five years of change in terms of the shift away from storefront retail and into more delivery and more different models. So as it relates to kind of the receiving end of the food model, you're seeing the growth of things like ghost kitchens, you're seeing more of a delivery model. And I would say that when you start kind of shaking up orthodox ecosystems or orthodox longstanding ways of doing business, I think that has a really interesting way of kind of rolling up the entire network of, of industry where, okay, we did this piece of innovation over here and that inspired someone to think about this other thing over here. And then that kind of triggered something loose over there. So I think there's going to be a really interesting knock on effect as people are thinking differently about ways to disrupt across the breadth uh, of of industry kind of inspired by that acceleration that was brought on by COVID and by the heightened awareness of things like food security and labor movement uh, as a result of, of COVID restrictions. Okay, good. Thanks. So thanks so much, Gavin. I'm sorry to jump in, you guys. We ran out of time. <laughs> That's um, but please do continue the conversation in the chat and the QA section. And everybody at home, I know this is so engaging. This video will be up online at cityage.com. Thank you so much to our panel. And Jason, thank you so much for being the moderator. Uh, as we move on, let's wrap up with our previous poll results. It'll pop up on your screen and you'll see. Um, what was the leading answer? It should be popping up any second there. There you go. How likely are we to have a good supply crisis in the next 20 years? Almost half of you say highly likely. So that was our final poll result. Thank you everyone for joining us. For our closing comments, we're going to hear from a true leader in Canada's agri-tech uh, sector. Dave Smart Smartin, rather, is the CEO of Bio Enterprise, leading Canada's top agri-tech 
Accelerator. Under his guidance, BioEnterprise is navigating the shifting Canadian landscape of food, agriculture, and clean technologies and bringing deep impact locally and internationally through high growth scaling projects. So Dave, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Please wrap it up for us. Thank you very much. And uh, wow, what a pleasure to be on, be on this, uh, this event. Um, just the, the number of opportunities and challenges that were raised here today. I made like 10 pages of notes and I wish I could go through most of them and make all my comments, but I'll have to keep them fairly brief. Um, you know, Canada is the second largest country in the world. We all know that. We have been told that we're the breadbasket of the world. If you look at the commodities that we produce, we're typically in the top five to the top 15 globally. Um, we rank eighth in, in research dollars that are put into agriculture and agri-food across the country. And yet, when you look at our ability to move them into the marketplace, our, our innovation challenge, we are 20th on, on the global scale. We're one, one ahead of Slovenia. So one has to ask, and by the way, I've been to Slovenia, it's a lovely country, but one has to ask, why are we not punching above our weight? Why are we not doing better when it comes to moving innovation into the marketplace? Lenore said a couple of really pointed things here. She says, can't, being Canadian is taking the money and spreading it across as many organizations as we possibly can. That's exactly what we do. We don't build critical mass. And so when I look at uh, what's going on in, in Vanagon, um, my gosh, I'm so jealous. You know, uh, Jacques talked about R&D departments of private sector companies. He talked about government support as a catalyst. He talked about research and academia, uh, accelerators, incubators. He talked about three municipalities working together. That's pretty foreign for Canada. Most of our municipalities compete with one another. Uh, and then you have the investment side. We went out at BioEnterprise about two years ago, and we, we did a, a survey of universities, of Canadian national companies, of multinationals, and we asked them for their opinions on our ecosystem within agriculture and food. First thing they said was it's fragmented, which we already know, uh, being a big country scattered across so many provinces, it's bound to be fragmented. Um, they said also that the incubators and accelerators and innovative, innovative uh, centers are insular. There's a lack of, of, of collaboration and there's a tendency for them to be competitive with one another. Those things are not going to generate efficiencies in our ecosystem. And the last panel just talked about this in spades. You know, how do we bring the ecosystem together? So we went back out and we created something called Canada's Food and Agritech Engine. And it is exactly that. It's an engine that brings incubators, accelerators, academia, private sector investment, all of them to the table into a Canadian network. And We've been fortunate enough to have over a hundred member partners join us so quickly because they bought into that objective, that vision. They recognize that while there is a, a real importance for local incubators and accelerators, municipal support for those things, regional support and provincial support, as Dr. Newman said, you've got to have a global perspective. How are we going to get across Canada and then outside internationally if we don't compete with our innovation, we're going to be behind the eight ball in, our, in all of our projects. So the interesting thing here is, is that we've, we've got partners across the country, some very significant ones. In Manitoba, we've recently got a partnership with Emily, who is also a sponsor of, of this event. And we're also a partner with the University of Fraser Valley. Um, thank you for them. We are partners with InnovaCorp in Atlantic Canada with Zone Ag Tech in Quebec. We've got numerous partners in Ontario and uh, Platform Calgary and Tech Edmonton and, and Alberta and others. Um, our goal is, is pretty simple. Our goal is to, is to create an efficient, efficient engine in Canada that we can be proud of where we are all collaborating and communicating and cooperating on business opportunities. And so I think uh, we've got a long way to go and it's a huge challenge, but I think we're on the right track. And uh, if we can just get Canada from number 20 on that list of innovation up to number 10 and then up to within the top five, uh, I think it would make sense. Agriculture is just so important to this country, we've gotta be showing better. So this, this event has caused me to ask a whole lot of questions and to, and to rethink some things. I absolutely wanna have a close look at the, uh, uh, at the study that, um, that uh, Dr. Newell was doing. Uh, there's so much 
comprehensive information in that study. I just, I'm just dying to have a, a closer look at it. And um, I, think, I think I'll stop there. I mean, there's so much more we could be talking about. Uh, like I said before, with um, what Jason said in his, in his, uh, um, his um, panel, you know, there's now a recognized need to start working together nationally. And um, I, think, I think we can do this. I, think, I really think we can. It's a challenge, but you know we've got we've got Vanagon and Israel to look at as 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 examples, and uh, let's strive for that. Great, great event. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll pass it back to our wonderful host. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, impactful closing remarks. I appreciate you doing that, and that wraps up our edition of the Future of Food 2.0. I want to thank once again thank our sponsors. Abbotsford Tech District, Emily, Bio Enterprise, Farm Credit Canada, and the University of the Fraser Valley. Um, and I want to thank you at home for watching and the network of more than 10,000 leaders in the business of building our cities for the future. I want to thank all of the panelists today. It was so incredible. I'm geeking out over here and I've missed a lot of the information. So I will be tuning into cityage.com to rewatch this and you can do that. Look at the site next week for that update. We've been bringing City Age to you virtually from the very start of the pandemic and we'll be letting you know about the Future of Food live conference when we can meet up safely again. Until next time, stay well, eat well, and stay in touch. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Zara Alani. <laughs>